it's who was worse, you know, Stalin or Hitler. I said, well, don't forget Mao. Um, Mao probably the most. Uh, Stalin was one of the first and most brutal. The Nazis the most industrial. So there's a lot of those horrors that you looked at, but why would people who think they're good do such evil? And that becomes a tremendous uh, philosophic and religious question. Join the best in the movement. It's conservative conversations with ISI, educating for liberty since 1953. Welcome back. You're listening to Conservative Conversations with Marlo Slayback and Tom Saroof. Our guest today is Dr. Cliff Porter, who has both a PhD and an MD. So he's a doctor in both senses. And we're, ta- we're going to be talking, I think, pretty have a wide ranging discussion between um, the work of Cliff's PhD and uh, I think modern European history, and then also his work as a physician. So welcome, Cliff. Thank you. And I think first question, you have a PhD in European history. When we met, you told me that that was the first thing to come. What initially attracted you to European history? What did you sort of focus on? And what do you think is important for Americans to know about uh, European civilization for our own? That's a short question. Um, Do it in 10 words or less. Well, I grew up in the shadow of the Cold War. And uh, uh, my dad taught at university, taught political philosophy, so I was always around some of that. And curious about, um, you know, why did the world develop the way it did? So you end up going back further and further. And, uh, you know, World War II, how that started, World War I, uh, Europe of the period. And then, uh, so I just found that very fascinating, just became more and more involved. And I really enjoyed the idea of teaching. And so um, part of it was the circumstances that existed drove me into history. It wasn't a escape from the present. It was to understand the present. So I ended up studying um, the totalitarianism, which is the worst of the worst. And how do they... So Germany was the most educated uh, society uh, in, in the world at the time. And of course, still, they, they still are. But why did it become the most brutal and the most barbarian when you think in terms of the Holocaust? So I ended up studying uh, in the Claremont the, uh, the development of three political philosophers from three different perspectives who fled Nazism, who understood and they recognized it where so many other people failed. Um, Hannah Arendt, who wrote The Origin of Totalitarianism, she's left wing. She's independent left wing, but a lot of people say she's conservative writer. She wasn't. She was actually very left wing. Um, but she was independent and she had to flee the Nazis. Uh, the other one was Leo Strauss. Uh, and then an other colleague, uh, the philosopher Eric Vogelin, who all knew each other and wrote to each other. So I found it fascinating reading their correspondence, their literature, and how they fled from it. So why did an educated nation fall and then become so barbaric and destroyed humanity of, of so many other people? That's kind of what drove me. And uh, a lot of people look at the horrors of Nazism, and, uh, communism, and, and so many others. And uh, the, uh, quite often people compare the different totalitarians who was worse, you know, Stalin or Hitler. I said, well, don't forget Mao. Um, Mao probably the most. Uh, Stalin was one of the first and most brutal. The Nazis the most industrial. Pol Pot was then, Cambodia was the most efficient. So there's a lot of those horrors that you looked at, but why would people who think they're good do such evil? And that becomes a tremendous uh, philosophic and religious question, theologic question. It's, it's nature of human existence. We all think we're good, so why are we doing bad things? And you can see that reflected right now. Uh, people who, um, it happened during COVID, and it's happening during these, uh, you know, the various Hamas-led protests in different parts where people who should know better, arguing for taking other people's rights the way in the U.S. and taking their lives. And their lives. So a lot of these things keep coming back again and again. So that quite often drove me to understand these things. Now, uh, my own involvement in war, uh, was uh, as a reservist to end up you know, being mobilized years ago. My civilian job downsized, and then the Army gave me the opportunity to go into medicine. So I was, I was, I was joking at the conference, you know, uh, I saw this comic years ago in the National Review. The um, a young guy talking to an old guy in the toga. It's my life story. I told you this, Tom. Is, uh, uh, sorry, Socrates, there's just no money in philosophy. I'm going to study under Hippocrates, even though they're two generations apart. But... Um, an interesting thing, just to segue to the medical piece, is German physicians had the highest percentage of professions joining the Nazis before they came to power. So that's a rather uh, damning view of what uh, 
uh, of the profession of, uh, of medicine in Germany at the time. There's many different reasons for it, but part of it, it goes back to the undermining of humanity, the undermine, undermining what an individual is, undermining of human consciousness, the Geist, to use a German word, the soul, uh, use, your, use your favorite term. But when humanity is understood in those racial terms, which was occurring in an age of nationalism, 19th into the 20th century, and also uh, within context of World War I and Darwinism. So when humanity is understood in those biologic terms, uh, now there's a lot of debate right now between man, what's, it, what's man versus woman with DNA as well. Those, let me tell you first, Mother Nature doesn't care what people's politics is. You know, XX and XY are a different thing. But when your humanity is understood in biological terms, then the evolution of a race or a species becomes almost a political ideology. And that's what the Nazis picked up on. They, were, they didn't invent it. This had been going on a generation, and these are the world that Hitler lived in. So there's a lot of German physicians, and this occurred in the United States too, and other parts of the world, looking about uh, the evolution of humanity in biological terms. So if someone was less uh, less intelligent, Down syndrome, or some other intellectual, you know, born genetic disability, are they inferior people? Now, in religious terms, uh, in the many of the great German, a handful of great German theologians and priests like the Bishop Galen said, no, no, humanity is understood in terms of the soul. But the, in the scientists um, and physicians said they started understanding in terms of biology and who would be in charge of it? Who's the most superior? Physicians. So it was a tremendous superiority complex. So it's an ideology that fed the ego. And what's that thing that's greatest before the fall? Pride. So come, comes again and again. So a lot of that, so that's what I'm studying now is a group um, called the White Rose, which was a group of medical students primarily and young students uh, who rose up, who grew up under Nazism, became um, uh, med students under the regime, and actually some of them served on the Eastern Fronts as medics. They resisted Nazism and wrote letters in, uh, in pamphlets and spread them out the University of Munich, calling for a rise up against uh, the brutal uh, and inhuman Nazism. So here's some med students who resisted the Nazi ideology, whereas the physicians were actually in favor of the ideology. Not all of them, but many of them. It's quite complex, but it's really insightful to look at why did these students see the anti-Semitism argument, as one student said, it just rolls off. It just doesn't, it, it, she's 16 or 17 year old, her name is Scholl, said, um, you know, I just don't buy that stuff about the Jews. It, it just, it, in her upbringing, which was classic Judeo-Christian Western tradition, it, she was impervious to it. But people who had lost sight of that and bought into this science makes, you, makes the person. They were susceptible, lost their defenses against um, ideologies, and they succumbed to it. And then you had guys like Mengele who served the Nazis. There's a, there's a good chunk of human history in, in five minutes. Hey there, listener. I wanted to take a quick moment to thank you for listening to Conservative Conversations. This podcast is a production of the Intercollegiate Studies Institute, and our mission here at ISI is educating for liberty. If you'd like to join us in fulfilling our mission, consider helping us by rating and reviewing this podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, wherever you listen to help us reach more listeners like yourself. Now, back to the show. Yeah, no, that's definitely a lot to unpack. And something that came to mind as you were discussing um, kind of some of the more nefarious aspects of the medical field, especially during that period of time in um, you know Nazi Germany, is I was I was thinking of uh, a number of stories that I heard years ago about um, the DEIification of the medical profession, especially at the level of um, even, you know, admissions to, to medical schools. And I, I remember one medical school, I don't remember which one in particular, um, or it wasn't the, well, it was, it was the hospital. It was just the medical system itself. Um, one, a major one tied to a university, I think in the Midwest, but, um, they were, they, I think they ended up scrubbing it from their site, but they had, um, posted about, or there was some leak of a story about how, they were training um, 
med, med students and they were giving out this general guidance to you know to the to the medical staff at the at you know the medical system there about um incorporating elements of um you know economic disadvantage socioeconomic dis- disadvantage and also racial politics um into determining um you know the the priority that some patients would have over others based on immutable characteristics like race um you know of course like uh, probably a lot of it tied into um some of the um you know the, the sexual aspects of it the you know lgbtq you know all of the different things that go into the DEI uh, approach that has um, kind of been adopted by most major American institutions. So how do you think, I'm interested in this idea of um, education and the the platforming, especially in in society of, especially one that um, perhaps prioritizes or um, deifies in a sense the uh, the prestige of the medical profession, how that plays a role in what we're seeing. And it's almost not, I don't want to say the complete opposite if, issue of what perhaps happened in Nazi Germany, where there was, you know, actual like, you know, genocide. Um, we, I don't, there's no genocide occurring in the U.S. to my knowledge. Um, but uh, what would you say as a as a you know physician yourself about some of those more nefarious aspects um, that do include the consideration of um, these immutable characteristics and the type of healthcare you receive or the type of priority of healthcare that you receive. Well, there's um, there's a lot of parallels, and you know I like to tell uh, students, and I don't get a lot of this coming into my clinic because when they come to my clinic they're sick and they need some, but Mother Nature doesn't care about our politics, you know, and. Uh, the father time doesn't either. There's, there's no solution to mother nature and father time. They, they, they do what they want. Well, you know, a lot of people talk about what's the social determinants, determinants of health. It's like if you grew up in an area where, uh, West Texas, where there's very few, uh, hospitals and clinics and you're driving hours to get one of there, it's going to affect your health in an area where there's, uh, uh, poor transportation, uh, uh, higher income, higher crime, actually higher, not higher income, lower crime, higher crime. It, that makes it difficult sometimes to go get the care. And um, those are legitimate under, uh, points to make. Then to make a blanket statement that, um, you know, everyone's a racist in medicine, if you don't buy into that, just really hurts it. Because the, the core of medicine, where you can get away from all that political ideology, is the person in front of you, what signs and symptoms they're showing, uh, and then how can you treat it? Now, if a physician has some racist viewpoints, political viewpoints, and that's coloring and uh, giving a warped view of the person in front of them, whether they hate, just pick pick your selection of anyone, they're going to do bad medicine. That is violating the Hippocratic Oath. Now, the DEI and other things like that, politically correct, woke, all these different ways, they want to get rid of some things that are real problems. You don't want someone with a KKK treating someone who they view as subhuman or a a physician like Mengele, Aryan, uh, the, uh, for those who don't know, one of the doctors at Auschwitz, is uh, he's going to treat a, a, a Jewish um, or a Slavic patient worse. Of course, you want to avoid that type of racism. But when you then look at it in a general view, like they're doing in some of these uh, hospitals uh, and clinics, they're telling the doctors to think a certain way in a political ideology. They're making the same mistake the Nazis did. They're putting the, the political ideology before the facts of nature. And Mother Nature still doesn't care. I made that point. And so it's uh, uh, any time that you look at a person uh, as part of a herd, and we did this during COVID, we looked at the population like a herd, the individual is lost. It undermines the individual. And then actually, so the United States should have half the amount of uh, deaths and complications from COVID. But because of politics of it, it got a lot worse. So that's another uh, another three hour podcast for you. Could you describe a bit more what you mean by that um, in terms of the COVID example in the United States? Um, the uh, as to uh, why it was so bad uh, here in the United States and the politics of it. Yeah, uh, certainly. The um, so I was uh, uh, briefly stated. I'm not an insurance clinic and. Uh, 
so I wasn't, I don't work for anyone. I don't respond to uh, the insurance company's requests on some administrators or anything else. I'm just doing it according to the Texas Medical Court, Medical Science of Hippocrates again, and what the person in front of me needs. Well, just as a point, I've opted out of Medicare, which makes it easier to see Medicare patients. So I can't bill Medicare for my services, so I don't have to report to them all the things they did. Well, during COVID, public health officials, uh, you know, they're trying, especially early on, no one knew what was going on with COVID or we were trying to figure it out. Uh, we had to make a lot of assumptions. And uh, so, you know, you're going to make mistakes when you're trying to make decisions with incomplete data. So public health officials were trying to say, how do we respond to this type of pandemic? We haven't seen at this level before. You know, those are perfectly appropriate questions. But public health officials made a mistake. Um, public health, you know, I don't work for public health. The Austin director of public health then the Texas director of public health, just using the Texas example, or the um, CDC, NIH, I don't work for them. Those physicians chose to work for the government. But they certainly acted like I worked for them. And so their objective was, how do we stop the pandemic? Appropriate question. So then they started doing things to manipulate the population with the best of intentions. And they failed at it. And then they chose, and there's only a handful of people who are in charge of these policies. To, you know, just top down. And they made just error after error. Um, you know, Fauci made himself the face of COVID. And so he wants to make himself the face of it. He gets the blame of it. Let me give you an early example. Hydroxychloroquine. Some of you guys may, yeah, do you guys remember that at all? Yeah. Um, this is a uh, malaria drug we use for, uh, also it's anti-inflammatory, so we use it for people with rheumatoid arthritis or similar uh, without being a steroid. So we've been using it for years. During SARS, uh, serious acute respiratory syndrome, that was COVID-1 in 2002 and three. people who were taking hydroxychloroquine and chloroquine didn't get a sick. So this is the time when we were looking at repurposing drugs. This was very early on. Uh, and um, so there had been research study done in 2005 that showed hydroxychloroquine blocked the ability of the virus to attach to your cell walls. So let's look at using this. And so there's a bunch of us doing research on these things. And we found this, uh, started trying to use it about a week before it became a big political show. Well, then the reason that they came out and said, don't use it, they're worried about a run on hydroxychloroquine, a panic run, like a bank run during the crash. Everyone's you know, run on the banks, a run on the drugs. So they told people it doesn't work, don't use it because they hadn't investigated it. Well, I tell you, it worked for about five months then it didn't. And, and this, is the, uh, this is the part of medicine that's hard, is um, the virus became more contagious. It, uh, and I make the joke, it didn't you know, have one of those uh, caffeine energy drinks, have better wings and fly, as one of the ads does. That doesn't make a uh, virus more contagious. What makes it more contagious is it attaches stronger to your cell walls. And so that's what COVID is, is it adapted, it became stronger. And then hydroxychloroquine was no longer a competitive receptor. This is a competitive inhibitor. That's what we think. So, because it no longer worked, I had to adjust and we went to other medications. Well, the public health officials said, don't use hydroxychloroquine, then later don't use ivermectin because they wanted everyone to do, uh, go one way to stop the virus and get to COVID zero. So even though there's many physicians who said, no, no, that doesn't work. Uh, what was the response of the public health officials, Fauci and others? Uh, do you guys remember the Great Barrington Declaration? Yep. This place called Great Barrington, a group of physicians and research scientists got together and said, these lockdowns aren't going to work. It's a nice idea. Lock everyone down to flatten the curve, decrease a mass assault on the healthcare system so we can manage it. That's understandable logic. Um, but when the guys in Great Barrington said, this isn't working, here's the data, this doesn't work. What do they choose to do? The public health officials choose to do. Reassess their uh, viewpoints? Nope. Attack the attacker. Accuse the accuser. And so I call this, uh, again, picking up from the European history, because that's where I used to live, is uh, the benign hubris of the noblesse oblige. So, or benevolent, I should say. It wasn't benign. Um, it was well-intended arrogance by people who thought they were in charge of the little people. So it's the old Victorian and, and the, uh, the uh, actually earlier than that, ancient regime, French term, the obligation and ability to look after us little people. So... What does that noblesse oblige require? Little white lies to try and manipulate us to do the right thing. And it's been a disaster. 
So uh, yesterday morning, I was talking with a young mom who will not get her child vaccinated for common things, with which there isn't a controversy because she doesn't trust the government. So now we're seeing an uptick in diseases that should have been eradicated, you know, a generation ago. So it's been an absolute disaster by the arrogance of public health officials. And so what do they want to do to physicians who, uh, and this, this speaks back to the Germany uh, part with physicians. What do you do to physicians who are out of line or nurses who wouldn't get vaccinated? Attack them, take away their career. And if you have a, you know, if you're a young physician or nurse and you have a family and you've got a mortgage, are you going to say no and stand to your principles and lose your job? So it was absolutely horrible what they did. Um, and there's a couple of key people do that. It was Walensky just lied to Congress, Fauci, just, you know, Collins. Nice thing about being an independent doctor, what are they going to do to me? <laughs> so, uh, some states, the governors were able to control their local medical boards and went after independent doctors who didn't toe the party line. So that's an important lesson from Nazism. It's an important lesson that was redone during uh, during COVID. As uh, I saw another, I, I, I think in terms of philosophy through uh, comics I see in the National Review, but another one was an old guy sitting there saying, uh, those who uh, don't learn from history are destined to repeat it. And then the other guy says, yeah, and those of us who do learn from history are destined to watch it get repeated and you know, sell that a little bit with COVID. So during COVID, uh, here's a couple of clear examples. So many people think that children were at risk for COVID. We knew in February of 2020, children and asthmatics were not at higher risk. Now, emphysema is because it's, that's more respiratory vascular disease. So if you smoke, don't smoke. It's bad for you. Um, and if you don't smoke, don't start. But um, asthma is not a risk. COVID was not a risk to children. But they still wanted to vaccinate children. They still want to lock down children. Um, then when they thought, of, hey, if we give everyone vaccinated, then we can stop the virus from expanding. Again, it was a well-intended idea. There's lots of conspiracies out there. But as a friend of mine said, I've walked the halls of power. And a lot of these people aren't that bright. <laughs> so <laughs> they, uh, So trying to lock down everyone trying to force everybody to be vaccinated, they stop the virus from spreading. Well, the vaccines, and that's a whole other argument and discussion about what was done right and not right there. The vaccines worked very well for uh, people at middle-aged, older, and other higher risk factors, uh, heart disease, obesity, smoking, stuff like that. It worked very well at reducing the severity of COVID. It really did. It didn't help at all in prevent spread. And, but they still pushed it, not, Two six months after it was done, they've been still there's still people pushing it for, for two years. Now the fear tactic that it develops people, people afraid of losing their jobs, you know, go bankrupt. And you know, I knew people with small businesses lost their, their businesses because of COVID. I was at a uh, Texas State Senate committee talking, you know, asking a bunch of people their opinion on COVID. They thought one of the questions was COVID vaccine for college students. And one of the bills was to prevent universities from forcing college kids from getting COVID vaccine. Because the death rate amongst healthy adults under the age of 25 uh, from COVID is virtually zero. The number of young people who died during COVID all had significant complications. Severe obesity, sickle cell disease, uh, it's a terrible disease, uh, and thing, that's a vascular disease, so things like that. So there's a couple guys to the sitting to the right of me. Uh, one guy, his... Uh, his way of making his point was to yell louder in the microphone, which sometimes happened in his uh, Senate and House hearings. Uh, a guy to the far left was actually reading all good stuff, real research. People are doing a lot of good research. I'll tell him make a quick point about ivermectin in a minute, because that becomes a point of part of the controversy. The lady sitting between us seemed very nice, very honest, very sincere. And she said, this is Texas, and we believe in freedom. How can I be free if we don't require everyone to get vaccinated? So it was a very twisted way of looking at at, uh, at everyone else and looking at life. She was trapped in fear. So she was willing to take away everyone else's rights. Um, and it was just more than just requiring vaccination. You know, preventing people from speaking, she's, a, she's absolutely for, and I knew physicians, revoking people's individual free speech, revoking their ability to be on social media, revoking their ability to do a lot of things, and even to the point of arresting them to prevent them uh, challenging the government on the COVID policy. Because if we don't, we're all going to die. So it's lifeboat ethics. Nazis did the same thing, Mike. If we don't kill all the Jews, the Jews will kill us. And you see it in Himmler's speeches. He does he did that quite a bit. 
So it's quite remarkable. Here's an honest a, a lady who views herself good, honest person, is absolutely willing to take away everyone else's rights and force the vaccine on other people. So um, ivermectin, by the way, that became quite a controversy, and I actually looked into using it. And uh, it's a really, really good drug for parasites. It's a Nobel Prize winning uh, anti-parasite drug. It, um, and so we've used it for all kinds of things. It's also a little bit anti-inflammatory. So inflammation was a big problem to COVID. So they did a study, uh, several studies in India and Chile in 2020, and uh, people would come to the clinic uh, and they'd do a research study. So, you know, double blinded, properly done study, ivermectin versus not ivermectin to see if people actually got better from COVID and they saw a slight improvement with ivermectin. Unfortunately, the problem with the study, and this is unintended bias, it didn't include people who are seriously ill. They don't go to the clinic. They went straight to the, to the hospital. So you missed your most seriously ill people. That throws the study off. As the virus evolved, I tried ivermectin for some patients early on. And I just didn't see much benefit with it. We had much better benefit with uh, uh, a couple different medications, primarily steroids, well-timed, and monoclonal antibodies were spectacularly successful. So again, you know, as the things evolved, you know, we had to evolve with it. Public health, the CDC, NIH, those those organizations are way too sluggish to to keep up with uh, keep up with the COVID. So, the term that I think where you kind of address this, but this has become kind of a popular um, phrase, especially among the um, like folk libertarian right, like a very non ideological libertarian right that was very critical of um, some of these different you know, uh, initiatives that were taken in the pretext of public safety. Um, and the, the term is biomedical security regime, biomedical security state. And I'd be interested in hearing more from your perspective as a, as a practicing physician um, about how, especially during an emergency, and this is especially fascinating given your interest in Nazi Germany and perhaps some of the, um, the messaging that was used in those circumstances. Yeah. But how that paved the way for this excessive, you know, state-sanctioned power, the, the totalitarianism aspect. I mean, obviously, maybe we don't quite see it that way. But even the term, you know, like I, I couldn't help but think of the Committee of Public Safety that carried out the Reign of Terror and Revolutionary France. So it was, there were just so many aspects of having lived through COVID that. Um, I mean, I sometimes thought to myself, like, is everybody else seeing what I'm seeing? Um, you know, just trying to uh, get your head on straight when everything else seems to be in, in crisis and think, OK, like <laughs> some of these things are so on the nose. Do people not, you know, see what's what's happening? And I, I totally understand um, the case for uh, vaccinations, especially for people who are frail and unhealthy and um and that may that makes a lot of sense to me, but um, that I, I really appreciated that there was criticism coming from some very um, I know like Tom Wolf was uh, or sorry yeah yeah is that the right person Tom Wolf the um, he's like a folk libertarian that runs a podcast mm -hmm. Tom Woods sorry I'm thinking mm -hmm. of the author Tom Wolf and I always get their names confused it's Tom Woods but he he was one of the like ardent critics and we had him on the podcast to talk about the biomedical security state probably two years ago. Um, and I really appreciated that he just, he was like gung ho about this from the get go. And then people's minds started changing come, you know, 2021, they're like 20 or not even like 2022, 2023. And they're like, oh, okay. Like what happened to COVID <laughs> like went away. So, um, in, in terms of like the, the, you know, the security crisis and the crisis of like having to keep kids indoors and not going to school and zoom, zoom university, things like that. So what would you say, like, what does that term mean to you as a physician and what is, what is the general attitude now that you're seeing? You mentioned a case of vaccination uh, hesitancy, hesitance from, you know, a patient. I'm, def I'm definitely seeing that as well. So what do you think that changed in terms of attitude towards um, Americans' attitudes towards pharmaceuticals, towards medical, you know, medicine as an institution, um, you know, their general feeling of do they feel, especially ones that are more inclined to be, um, you know, more critical of the type of care they're receiving. Um, is that something that has shifted a lot? And do you see other historical, um, maybe, uh, um, you know, relations to that or 
uh, analogies or things that kind of you think of whenever you see what's happening and what happened in 2020? Well, there's uh, actually a, a couple of different interesting parallels you, you bring up. And uh, I'm totally going to add Committee of Public Safety to that article I'm writing. I, I, you got to mention Robespierre um, and, uh, in one way or the other, because the parallel is quite striking because they use that terminology and it is fear driven. If we don't, if you don't do this, you're going to, they're going to get you. Uh, and then you can pick an ideology and you'll see it. Uh, so Nazis, you know, of course they did the Jews, but not just the Jews, but one reason they got a lot of people who weren't necessarily anti-Semitic and German Jews to support Nazis. And there was, still was a handful of them. If, if we don't protect ourselves, the British, the French, the Russians are going to get us or the Bolsheviks. Are going to get us. And of course the Bolsheviks, the bourgeoisie is going to get you. So all these things are doing similar things. And in science, you add that, uh, you know, the seeming legitimacy of medical science. And they say, well, if we don't do this, we're all going to die of COVID. Or, you know, our brains are going to melt and leak out our ears, uh, hairs on fire. And I exaggerate a little bit. But one of the parallels, so I see two things that have occurred with this. One is the bad. There's so much distrust of public health. People are not doing intelligent things. And uh, vaccinating children for things that, that can kill a child. Um, so you, you know, that's really bad. The good side of it on the flip side is, is that people are doing a lot more research. And so I have people come in who research all that they're on the web search, uh, uh, all the time. I'm not going to mention any major web search browsers, not to give many advertisements, but, uh, they'll come in and research ahead of time. And to the hypochondriac, they're going to ask me a bazillion questions. That's one out of 20, one out of 30. Most people, when they they start doing research and they come to me with whatever it is, you know, strep, strep throat, sprained ankle, whatever, hypertension. They've, they've researched enough that we can have a much more intelligent conversation about their health. So actually I'm seeing a lot of benefit from that standpoint. The, um, and distrust of public health to get people away from taking these, you know, the government telling you this is good for you and all the rest of it. And the healthy distrust, I think, is bloody good. Now, uh, the fear that's used for a lot of people. So you know, I, I approach a lot of things from a, a religious standpoint. And uh, so uh, my view of life and afterlife is Christian. Uh, you know, I you know, don't want to die tomorrow, but, you know, I have a different view of it than someone who's an atheist. I think this is it. The fear of someone who thinks this is it is so much higher that they're willing to sacrifice others for their one life, which I thought was kind of a very interesting thing. And I saw that with the Nazism. But another point you mentioned earlier about DEI is, you know, there's these various uh, people in medical schools who are very much in an ivory tower, who don't have to pay the consequences of their ideas, are saying, oh, telling various groups and various minorities, your doctor's racist, uh, your doctor's this, your doctor that, you go to your doctor, not agree. so what do those people do? They don't go to the doctor. Now their hypertension is not controlled, the diabetes is not controlled, and they get worse outcomes. So it's almost self-fulfilling. So not being honest, you know, there's a, there was a book years ago about, you know, everything I learned, I learned in first grade, be honest. <laughs> so just send that to Fauci, uh, by the way, that, uh, he did so much harm to the medical profession, so much harm to the medical profession by, by uh, doing that. Um, I think I got most of your question there. Um, uh, need me, get me back on, uh, back on track. Let me know. I think I got most of your, your points there. Yeah. No, that's yeah, I'd love to segue then. I think it's a good place to segue to your work now as a physician. Um, and specifically, you're, you do direct primary care, which is something I don't know personally a lot about, but I've heard about the terms. So maybe you can help uh, help fill in the blanks. What is it? How does it work? If I'm a patient and I'm coming to you, what is direct primary care? And how does it sort of give you the, that extra freedom or latitude from public health authorities or the Medicare system, things of that sort? Well, it's um, in, in many ways direct primary care, and there's direct specialists uh, doing direct cash pay. And basically, it's a membership model. So you pay a monthly uh, fee, and then uh, you get it's like having a it's a concierge medicine for people who work for a living. So uh, people need to come in to get seen, whatever, uh, or they need to text or call, they got some medical problem. There's no co pays, there's no billing of insurance, there's no pre authorizations. It's just old school medicine. Although I promised to have read a book recently. I'm not that old school, but uh, it's the way it used to be. It's just simple. You know, you have a direct relationship with the, with the physician. And I have two physician assistants who work with me as well. So we're a little larger, but um, 
if people have whatever their medical condition is, they want to come in, uh, you know, it's far lower volume. So people can come in right away. If they say, oh, I just need your blood pressure refill, you know, I'll, I text a refill for a guy's blood pressure medicine from my brother's boat while I go fishing. It wasn't that good. <laughs> the cell tower. Anyway. Now, the reason this is extraordinary is because everyone thinks medicine is based on you come in, expect to wait 30 minutes if you're lucky, usually one to two hours. The medical system comes in and asks you 10, 15, 20 stupid questions, uh, some good questions, but a whole lot of questions that seem redundant. The uh, doctor, PA, nurse practitioner comes in, you got five minutes, they're paying on the computer, then they take off and we're left with a referral or a, or, a, or a prescription. And everyone thinks, and then it gets billed to insurance. And everyone thinks that's how medicine is. So a lot of the questions they ask you when you come to a clinic is about charting. And the charting is for billing, whether it's insurance or Medicare. So they ask you all kinds of questions and it's all about making the chart look bigger so they can justify more billing. Well, Medicare insurance, they keep on reducing how much the reimbursement is, so the doc's got to go more. They have to see three to four patients an hour. Just keep moving the treadmill. Well, by doing a membership-based, all that crap goes away. Instantly gone away. 90% of the administrative burden of medicine is gone by practicing medicine this way. So it's, um, it's myself, two PAs, I have a business manager and two medical assistants, and I might hire a third medical assistant a little later this year. That's it. Yeah. Whereas most other places have a much higher amount of people who are doing their billing cycle and all this, so it's much, much, much more expensive. So this allows me just to practice medicine based on what I think needs to be done. So if someone's coming in, I'm not looking at the charting, how I'm going to get reimbursed. I don't care. They already paid their membership. So it takes money off the table. Then what we do then is if someone needs, they need labs, they need uh, medication stuff. We try and get the wholesale cost for them. So uh, I have a, a contract with a, a large national lab company, LabCorp. And so I guarantee them payment. So they give me the wholesale cost and I just pass that along to my patient. So a cholesterol check, you go to some place on the corner or you know, some other place, retail would be 20, 25, 30 bucks for cholesterol check, probably 50, 75, maybe even hundred dollars for a testosterone check. So the serum testosterone cost through me is four bucks. Cholesterol check is two and a half bucks. It's 90% less. Uh, so it, it tells you how convoluted the system is. So I can do 85% of medicine, which is primary energy care, um, you know, for pennies on the dollar. So I charge, um, each place is a little different. They charge them from 50 to $150 a month. I charge $90 a month for an adult, half price for spouse and kids. And other more expensive areas be a little less, uh, more rural areas, they can probably charge a little, a little less or more. And so you can take care of most of medicine pretty, that, pretty easily that way. Now, a lot of people worry about the catastrophic bit or the major medical. You know, I, I joke that I watched Young Frankenstein three times. I still don't do brain surgery. And uh, <laughs> the uh, don't tell the next Texas Medical Board I'm watching Frankenstein for my, uh, my medical knowledge. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, um, you know, that's where people combine what we do with a major medical problem, whether it's a high deductible insurance. I have Medicare patients. And as I said earlier, I opted out of Medicare. So I can have Medicare patients come to see me and I don't have to follow Medicare. And they use Medicare for the major stuff or health share plans like the faith-based ones like Samaritan, Christian Health Share. And there's non-faith-based ones like Sidera and Zion. And there's Crowd Health, which is a kind of like crowdsource health funding for healthcare. And, uh, and uh, there's some other smaller in, uh, insurance companies that work just with businesses that incorporate what we do with them for the major stuff. So there's ways to actually get good healthcare far cheaper. And then the evidence shows it's far, far better medicine than a fraction of the cost. So uh, a lot of people are so used to the other way of doing it when I explain to them, no, no, you can come in and get seen. And here's two kind of dynamics of it. One is a lot of people think they sprain their ankle, their kid has strep, they have to go to an urgent care clinic because you can't get in to see your primary care guy for one to two to three weeks, right? Or three months if you're at FQHC in downtown. Well. Our schedule is so flexible, we can get someone to fit in almost every day, um, and if not next day. So we explicitly tell people we do primary and urgent care. So they don't go to urgent care and spend $150 for a copay for something I can take care of on the phone. You know, so it's far better uh, as, aspect of medicine that way. The other thing is on medications. Most medications we can get generic, pretty cheap. 
Um, there's the expensive drugs, like certain autoimmune disorder uh, drugs, Humira, Dupixent, and things like that. That you know, that's what ins where insurance can help pay for a five thousand dollar a month drug, or for oncology. That's what insurance is for. But we can take care of most things that way. The other thing is, I tell people shop cash prices. So a lot of people will go in and they'll get uh, and they get an X-ray for a sprain or ankle. I had a couple of sprained ankles this week. It's on my mind. And uh, they sprain an ankle. You go in and the insurance, well, the, the deal through insurance, uh, you haven't met your deductible, as 90% of people don't. So therefore, it's $100, $150 for the x-ray. And that counts towards your deductible. I can get an x-ray uh, in most places, $40 to $50. So what's, the, what's that $50 to $100 difference? It's all going to middlemen. All the middlemen want to get their cut. I think healthcare is the dirtiest business uh, in the U.S. right now. And I, I can't think of a more one that has more convoluted middlemen and, and with oligarchies and cartels and corruption, to put it bluntly. So, you know, when coming back to segue back to COVID, is this allowed me tremendous freedom in actually treating people as they showed up. So I, we looked at hydroxychloroquine, we looked at dexamethasone, we looked at ivermectin, just to give you some examples of medication. Then we found the best things that work for people. So, uh, and then a lot of places, and this tells you how screwy the system is, um, a lot of major hospitals uh, and who owned clinics closed the clinics. So you had to go to the ER if you had COVID. And then they couldn't get reimbursed unless your oxygen level dropped lower because that's Medicare standards below 88%. Well, that's really seriously ill by that time. Some good hospitals gave people a pulse ox thing because they couldn't admit them to the hospital. Little, the, the little finger pulse ox readers, see what your oxygen level was. Give you a tank of oxygen and said, keep it up above 96, 97, come back if you can. By doing that early, long before the current treatments we had, they saved a lot of lives. The big hospitals that are driven by equity investment guys, it's an editorial comment there, by the way, um, they, they delayed care so they could bill two to three times more. Um, and calling it COVID, and they can build 10 to 20 times more than a simple outpatient clinic like mine would do. So they wanted people, I don't say they wanted, but if people weren't sick enough, then they couldn't bill higher. So a lot of people weren't getting treatment early. Early treatment saved lives. They didn't do it. And that's why we had a much, much higher mortality than we should have. They use the term mortality and morbidity. Mortality, death, morbidity, serious illness. Well, I started myself in October of 2019. Um, so talk about timing. That's when the virus uh, leaked out of the Wuhan lab. I mean, it's pretty clear, too. But uh, it, uh, uh, and now I've had, now i got six, six employees. So I expanded during COVID because we were available. Then they saw how our system worked. And then I got businesses who are now adopting us. And they combined it with their catastrophic insurance. Costs. I joke that uh, me and Bill Gates set the whole thing up just to build my business. <laughs> Just we're almost we're basically out of time. My one final sort of follow up is it's as you're describing it. It sounds pretty amazing. Lower costs, more direct access, more flexibility when it comes to care. You cut out all the bureaucracy. No misaligned incentives. Correct. What's the catch? What's the catch? Um, yeah, and I don't mean that in a technical way. Well, how does I mean, this? How does it all work? Ultimately, medicine is individual, and so each person they ask me, you know, like, how does this fit to me? And that's why I'm glad to tell. Them. The, um, but like, um, the taxi businesses was a problem. How did you get around that? You couldn't reform it when that Uber and Lyft. How do you get around the convoluted medicine? People can get choices and they go find it. You know, uh, competition medicine, I say freedom and choice in medicine. Uh, the catch is, you know, here's my monthly fee. Uh, if you, uh, and that, and, you know, just tell people up on how it works. You lose some business. Some people want to use their insurance. Fine. You know, find something that fits you. Uh, this fits for, for myself, and right now we have 1,250 people who are in our practice. Wow. Well, Cliff, this has been great. Um, I appreciate you coming on. Lots of interesting discussion about medicine and health and how that connects to Nazism and ideology and intellectual history. So really interesting about discussion. We minutes to solve everything else. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Um, we are out of time, though, so... I will look forward to seeing you in November when you present on the White Rose for the American Politics and Government Summit at ISI in November. And if people want to follow your work in the meantime or look more into your uh, medical practice, where should they look? Very simple. TXMedicalCare.com. The, the Texas Direct Medical Care is the name of our practice, but TXMedicalCare.com.
Awesome. Well, if you're in the Texas area, I recommend take, looking into it. Um, thanks again, Cliff. All right. Thanks, Tom. Thanks, Marlo. Thank you for listening to Conservative Conversations with ISI. If you've enjoyed this episode, be sure to check out our website at isi.org slash resources to see all that we offer our members, including the Intercollegiate Review, Select Modern Age articles, debates, lectures, and of course, this podcast. Thanks again for listening. Don't forget to rate and review, and we will see you next time on Conservative Conversations with ISI.